So today, 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 we are going to talk about uh, dissonance versus tension and what the differences are between dissonance and tension. Because um, you can have dissonance without tension and you can have tension without dissonance, but they're often really closely connected because like if I play this chord, for example, or I'll play it a little bit higher up. This chord is very tense. It wants to go somewhere. It wants to go specifically to here. Which we'll get into why tension is tension and, and why distance is not necessarily tension. But part of the reason why we consider it uh, tense is this relationship right here. Which I'll, I'll put the notes on screen. It doesn't quite matter what notes I'm playing. It's more what you're hearing. That right there is an interval, uh, the relationship between two notes of a tritone. This is E and this is B flat or A sharp. It's a very, very uh, unstable sounding uh, interval. <clears throat> and uh, it's the kind of seed, I would say, to where this whole discussion goes. So let me grab my uh, teaching piano so I can actually show you what I'm playing. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about kind of... Uh, this foundation of tension or dissonance, which is the dominant seventh chord. If I pull this all up an octave. There we go. So I'm actually going to pull this down because I think it will be better in this octave right here. There we go. Okay, so dominant seventh. How does this chord work? Well, functionally, it appears in the scale of F major as the fifth chord. <clears throat> so in terms of its relationships to the root of the key, um, it actually has a very special place. If we look at the harmonic overtones of the note F, uh, the harmonics or the 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 partials of a sound that make up that specific sound that contrasts it with like any other sound um, tends to follow this sequence where you have the the lowest frequency of the note then you have another frequency uh, that appears exactly one octave above that then you have a new frequency that appears an octave, and it's not exactly a perfect fifth. It's not exactly the distance between F and C, but it's like just, just barely far off enough that we can't tell the difference. Um, so these are the first uh, five overtones of the note F right here. And if you think back to where we started with that C major seven chord, or that C dominant seventh chord, excuse me, um, it starts with this note right here. And <clears throat> so the fifth being such a closely related note to the root gives it this sense of pull, this sense of power over the uh, the root chord of our key. Um, <clears throat> so even without that uh, dissonant interval right there, if I just play chord progression, um, then, oops, I'm gonna go to this, oops, just without that. And then we go back to our one. It still feels fine. Like the relationships of these notes moving together really just feels natural and comfortable and appropriate. Um, it might even sound a little bit cheesy, a little bit overplayed. 
Um, <clears throat> but uh, that is where we can start to split apart the tension from the dissonance. Because uh, what makes the five chord go to the one chord is partially the fact that, like I said, it's built off that second overtone right there. Um, and it's also something that uh, has been, like Indol Bass is uh, mentioning, has been kind of culturally beat into us. Over um, the past couple of centuries that we've had this kind of musical structure, I'd say it really started around the 1300s in Europe, uh, as far as the way that we use chords now, other civilizations, other countries, other continents have had their own kind of development of musical language. Um, but when we're looking at kind of the Western European kind of uh, development, that's typically what we look at is kind of the, the church tradition and how harmony kind of got instilled in us uh, through uh, essentially almost cultural means more than anything else. Um, but as we go through these different kind of distinctions between tension and dissonance, you might start to see where uh, the two collide, essentially, and where they diverge. But going back to the dominant seventh, if we remove the C, like motifs kind of, yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of a thing. Like, if I play this, at this point, most people in the chat, or at least a lot of people in the chat, recognize that little melodic riff. And culturally speaking, we accept that it works because we've heard that so many times over the past couple of decades that it's just become like, oh, a thing that works. But in addition to that, we can look at the dissonance in this chord, which we can get by removing the note from the root of our chord and removing the fifth of that root. We only get these two notes left going back to that tritone we were talking about. So let's let's think about this right here. Um, if we look at the distance between these notes, counting with this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is six semitones, six steps away from this E. Now, if I count up from this note right here to E, with this as zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's a symmetrical interval. It is in fact the only symmetrical interval that exists in our scale that we use for most music. Not every country, not even every uh, artist uses this 12-tone system, but it's kind of the default for most people. The distance between, uh, like, C and E is actually radically different than the distance from E to C. The distance from D to A is radically different, not super uh, different, but fairly different from the distance between A and D. There's a bit of a um, misshapen mirror effect going on, but that tritone, it is the only thing that breaks that rule. So it starts to feel kind of weird. It feels almost unstable. And because of that instability, it wants to do one of two things. It either wants to fall outwards, like that. Oh, there we go, I went one note too far, by one. Or it wants to collapse inwards by one. And if you go back to the chord we're building this whole thing off of, have these notes 
these two notes right here in this chord fall in to our root chord. So in terms of the way the notes themselves lead into the next chord, kind of separating uh, tension and uh, dissonance for a moment again, um, the voices want to move towards that chord of resolution that gives it that tension because it implies a release. Now, there is something else here going on, and it's the reason why this sounds good, but this sounds bad. Even though they're one note apart, and also this note doesn't really sound that bad, but this note sounds kind of bad, or tense, or uh, dissonant. So why is it that these two notes don't sound super bad? Remind me at the end of this topic, anyone. Remind me at the end of this topic, and yes. Um, but this one doesn't. Well, that comes down to the actual ratio between the intervals. If you look up harmonic ratios, so here we go. Uh, we might want a better one, but no, this should be fine. So we tend to look at intervals in terms of uh, their ratio, how many times one frequency oscillates, moves back and forth, compared with another ratio. If we look at the ratio between C and G, the distance between um, the root and its fifth, or if we want to look at it a different way, the distance between the first overtone and the second overtone, the relationship of those two notes. Now, I'm, at, I'm actually starting to think of some easy ways to remember this that are, that are really just coming to me now. So if this gets confusing, I, I apologize in advance. But we're going to do a little bit of math. We're going to count this note right here as the number one. If we want to start increasing up that harmonic overtone series I was talking about before, we just multiply that number by each successive number. So one times one is itself. One times two is two, which is this frequency. One times three is three, which is this frequency. Four, five, six, and then seven before we get to eight. Now, do you notice anything about the way my hands are right now? So, um, basically, yeah, very close, very close to the Fibonacci spiral. Yeah, it's a very similar sort of pattern. Um, you know, one times one, one times two, one times three, one times four, et cetera, et cetera. Or at least we could look at it as X times one. Yeah, so the the overtones of the of the this note right here they actually form a dominant seventh chord built into them now let's start looking at those ratios ruby thank you so much for the gift sub to sister cousin i really appreciate it thank you so much um but now we have eight numbers here the ratio between this one to this one, assuming this one, Ruby, thank you so much for the gifts of DeFlauschi. Holy shit. Thank you so much, Ruby. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It means a lot. The ratio of the perfect fifth, again, basing it off of the root, right, is three against two. Right? Because this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is 3 over 2. If we look at um, the relationship of uh, G to E, this is a relationship of 5 over 3. You could also look at the relationship this way. 
as in this is a three over four over five for our major chord. And I'm gonna show you a quick video from Adam Neely um, after we go over this thing that will help kind of recontextualize all of these ratios. But if we look at this, we're looking at either a ratio of uh, seven against four, which is kind of weird, or seven against two, which is a little bit more complex than three over two, or five over four, or five over three. It's a little bit easier uh, to feel that. And if we look at the uh, interval ratio of tritone, it should be around, yeah, 10 to seven. And that's a, that's a rough one. Oh, no, excuse me, 11, eight is a good one. Yeah. A harmonic ratio of uh, 11 over eight, which is really kind of weird to count. You know, if you had to try and count that starts to give us a way of um, thinking about the um, kind of relationship of notes in terms of consonance and dissonance. The simpler the ratio of a given interval, like a perfect fifth, a tritone, a flat nine, a major 11, it's all going to be based on how close their ratios are to simple, understandable numbers. And don't, don't worry too much about it. Um, I will ask, does anyone know what a, um, a polyrhythm is? Are we, is anyone familiar with the idea of a polyrhythm? Um, where if I get, say, two kick drums, and I have two kick drums. This kick drum can be thought of as being divided into four beats, or well, let's just say two beats. We'll just do two beats. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subdivide this into three beats in the same amount of time, right here. So we have two, Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, th two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And if I play them together, bum baka bum brum baka bum brum baka bum brum baka bum brum baka bum bum baka bum. It has like this really nice kind of galloping rhythm to it. It feels really nice, uh, in my opinion. Um, but. Let's try and keep this in mind. This is a ratio of three against two. Keep that in your head, uh, and we'll just watch this short little 10 minute video. I want you guys in this next demonstration to pay close attention to the feeling of the polyrhythm of four against five against six. Four evenly spaced pulses in the same amount of time as five evenly spaced pulses, as in the same amount of time as six evenly spaced pulses. Pay close attention to how the polyrhythm makes you feel. Then I'm gonna speed it up, and then like magic, it will turn into a major chord. I might have just ruined it for you, but let's, uh, let's try it. So, this is a regular kick drum. I'm gonna layer in the polyrhythm. Feels pretty cool, actually. When you speed it up, major chord. Yeah, so this might be kind of weird, but let me let me help break it down and then we'll circle back around to all the stuff about tension and dissonance, right? So 
I have like that similar sort of thing where if I sped this up, um, we might hear this. I think I would have to actually shrink this down, make this a little bit uh, smaller, um, not use such big subby kicks. Um, do stuff kind of like uh, you know this size for the the distance, and then speed that up. But if you try and think about what sound is on a conceptual level, you have something that pulses up, returns, and then pulses back up. So we have this rhythm back and forth. When we talk about hertz, something being at, say, 40 hertz, or 50 hertz, or 200 hertz, or 1,000 hertz, which is one kilohertz. Hertz is another way to say cycles per second. So this is hitting at a pulse of, uh, if I set this to 128, this is the distance of, uh, I think about one second. Yeah, this right here, uh, maybe if I get it to about here, or I guess it's 120. Yeah, 120, yeah, 120. This is the distance of one second. So this is an oscillation of two pulses per second. This is an oscillation of three pulses per second, or per second, excuse me. And as you saw with this video, which I can link in chat for y'all if you want to check out the full thing, yeah, it's kind of hard to think about, right? As you increase the rhythm of something, we stop hearing the oscillations. Let me give you a quick example of that. We're going to go a little bit deep uh, on this, so I apologize if we start going on tangents. Um, so let me grab my phase plant, and all we're going to do is we're going to grab a... Uh, square wave and I'm going to set it down as low as I can play it on the piano and then I'm going to set the harmonic ratio down to 0.5 those clicks that you're hearing are this mo are these moments I should say right here on the actual waveform. That's the sound of your speaker cone pushing out and then immediately snapping back in. Pushing out, snapping back in. Every time it changes position, we hear that little click. If I set this down to 0.25, we can almost count it. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... We have almost a tempo, right? Now, Set it back up to the lowest pitch. We're starting to lose our ability to hear the discrete pulses. And if I go up one octave, we're officially starting to hear those discrete pulses as a tone. So I'm going to just play a sine wave, right? If you're not on headphones, you might not. Well, I'll put, I'll put it a little bit higher so you can hear it. So now we have a sine wave. I'm gonna attach a low frequency oscillator, which as you can see is oscillating at one hertz. So this is one cycle every second. I'm gonna attach this to the phase of this oscillator right here. You can hear every second, it's going up and down once. If you watch up here on the clock, I'm going to start it at the next minute and count. Watch. Eight, nine. Yeah, now it's completing every second. Every single second. There's one pulse, right? Now I'm going to slowly turn up the rate of this LFO. And I want you to watch what happens. That little pitch warble effect gets more apparent, more apparent, 
we start losing kind of the overall like discrete up and down motions. Now we're kind of starting to hear it as like one warble. But watch what happens. Now, before I go any further, the human hearing range is about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. We're almost 20 hertz. So let's watch what happens when we cross over that threshold. Hmm. Notice how you can hear a tone. Hmm. As we get close to the actual uh, frequency value of the note I'm playing, because I'm I'm playing an F, and if we go look up like a frequency uh, to hertz chart, um, you can see like the whoop, frequency to hertz chat chart. Um, you get this uh, page right here, and if we go look at the lowest F, it's at 21.83. Notice how right around 20, 21 hertz, we are we started to hear our first tone. Now at 43.65, we're at almost 43.6, so right around here. We are essentially, like Jack is hinting at, modulating the frequency of this oscillator at a rate of a lower octave. And believe it or not, this is actually how FM synthesis uh, in the digital realm was invented. Before, uh, very recently, like the past three to five years, I'd say, there wasn't a good way to directly modulate the frequency, Wufu Beats, holy shit, thank you so much for that Twitch Prime. Thank you so much, Wufu, I appreciate it. Um, uh, where was I? Sorry. Uh, they could only modulate the phase of a of an oscillator. But as you can see, if you modulate the phase of something, it starts to sound almost like you're modulating the frequency. When I pull this back down, you can hear the pitch kind of warbling a little bit. Not as far as if I was modulating the frequency directly, but you can get a fairly similar effect just by um just by playing with phase. Um, and this kind of has to do with the fact that at a certain rate, we stop perceiving a change as discrete motions. And just like we stopped hearing, or we just like we stopped hearing that uh, square wave as this discrete tone, or this discrete pulse, and we started hearing it as a specific frequency, um, we can use that to pretty much determine, <laughs> as weird as it may sound, everything else that you want to know about music. Um, so if you are having trouble with this, don't worry. Just understand that this tangent is meant to help you understand pretty much everything that comes into play in music, especially when it comes to tension versus release. Now, the ratio, if we go back here, of these kick drums was what? Uh, two over three? And then if we look at the ratio of um, a tritone, what did we say? It was 11 over, 11 over eight. Um, where was that? Yeah, uh, 11 over eight, 11 over eight. Um, so let's set this up for eight. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this on here. And we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I need to do an 11. So I'm actually gonna do this in an instrument rack so it's a little bit easier. Um, so I'm going to drag this down here to load it into an instrument rack, set it to one-shot mode, and then I'm going to make 
a thing right here. Whoops. And then we're going to set this to eighth notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's how many we need. If you are in um, Ableton and you want to use uh, different modulations of uh, meter and you don't want to use only triplets, here's a trick. I have 11 pulses here. If you look at the very, oh, you can't quite see, but if I, if I select these right here, do you see this little marker right here? That actually lets you scale the notes. It lets you kind of push and pull. Do 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Select all of them. Grab that handle between the 11th and the 12th. Um, and there we go. Uh, were you oscillating the phase of so much? Yes. So serum does not quite have the same amount of control. And make sure you're modulating phase, not frequency. Serum's LFOs are kind of uh, rough when it comes to rates over 20 to 30. Now we have eight against 11. Let's see what 11 against 8 sounds like. This is the rhythmic version of a tritone. Can anyone count that? Can anyone? Can anyone count that? Because I can't. I, I, I can't, I, I can't, I can't follow that at all. I'm sorry. I can't follow that rhythm at all. No, it sounds kind of cool. It sounds pretty cool, but. Because, like, there's, like, a moment where you have, like, a, a two against three right here, but then it offsets. And then you no longer have that two over three. Like, the first moment, ba -ba -ba -ba. and then, oh. Yeah, you can, but Flauschy, that's the thing. You're saying to understand it, you have to isolate out and ignore one of the rhythms. So yeah, if I'm playing a fucking tritone, dun, I can just ignore, I can ignore the dun, I can ignore this, and just focus on this note. And yeah, it would probably sound a little bit better, but... Our ears don't always work that way. It takes a trained ear to be able to isolate out one rhythm against another. Um, this is, again, why simple harmonic ratios between intervals sound pleasant. Because, yeah, if you're a trained musician, no, totally. If you want, yes, no, absolutely, Flauschy, absolutely. But... If we are looking at this kind of on a broader level of like the topic of this discussion is tension versus dissonance, I wouldn't call this tense. I don't inherently feel tension with this rhythmic ratio. I feel uh, dissonance. It feels kind of confusing, um, and there would be a way to use that in a context to make it more appropriate, just like how if I play a dominant seventh chord, that tritone sounds appropriate because it's giving us a sense of tension into the release, right? So... Now that we have this in our heads, right? Let's start breaking back down sort of the way that we can perceive these ratios, right? So when you're looking at tension in something, what we're looking at is how it's leading somewhere. Um, if I do... And just leave that. If I just play, 
you're expecting something, right? Everyone right now has an expectation of what is supposed to happen. And me not playing it gives you a feeling of unease, right? It feels kind of weird. Yeah, people are like, are waiting for that. They want that satisfying conclusion to what's going on. Now, harmonically speaking, there isn't too much going on here. We just have a perfect fourth which is a perfect fifth inverted. A very clean ratio. A perfect fourth is not a very harmonically dissonant ratio. Um, it's not as consonant as a fifth, but it feels like it um, can work. But melodically, there is an expectation being built over, again, centuries of hearing that right there, or that right there, which comes down to this harmonic motion. The five to the one, again, um, <clears throat> where this creates tension that resolves the tension. Now, if I change the melody, it doesn't quite have the same tension, but it can still feel like it's resolving. So the dissonance of that kind of hinting like at that kind of relationship can totally go into a different um, world. So now let's think about things outside of notes that we can use to create tension and release. Here's a really, really, really simple one that you can do at home. If I just go ahead and get this tool I made called Track Breath, and I put in a MIDI note right here, I extend out that MIDI note, and then I automate this parameter. What do you think is going to happen at the end of this bar? Can anyone guess? how this is going to feel. What's it going to what's it going to make us feel when we do this? Ooh. There's a lot of tension built up right there, right? There's something we want. Yeah, it's a riser. Risers are a great example of building and decreasing tension. But compare that what we just heard with this. that tension has been dissolved. We accumulated a lot of energy and then we dissipate that energy in some way. Um, so even outside of notes, we can utilize um, things such as articulations. If I have something that's being played with a very soft, a very, it loses every, <laughs> shut up. Um, I almost did the data life joke. Um, you can uh, use like articulations, like I was saying, in terms of like uh, a violin that's playing a lot of lines that are very long and legato, like dun, 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 dun. Switching to those short, staccato, rhythmically punchy notes from that long phrase builds tension. It creates this expectation that something's happening because, just like this case, we are being denied a finish. We're being denied something we're expecting. We're expecting the note to continue on, but the note gets short and punchy. We're expecting the note to get quieter. It just grows and gets louder. We expect the energy to fall down, but instead we just get a build up. We expect, whoops, we expect to hear two bits, but instead we just hear. 
you just wait. And you just wait. You subvert the listener's expectations. Exactly. Exactly correct. As we go through different things, um, I'm not going to give you every possible example because we've already gone on this topic for nearly an hour. Um, so I think it would be good to start uh, moving on to something else. But I want to end now that we've completely dis or we've completely disconnected tension and dissonance. Tension wants to lead somewhere, dissonance pulls away. I would say that's a good way to start thinking about it. Another way to think about it is tension builds up an expectation, whereas dissonance uh, denies expectation. Because if I play this, whoops, let me get to my piano, and then I play this. Ooh. Those really complex ratios they feel like they're subverting, maybe not subverting, they're maybe uh, not fulfilling our expectations. Um, and sometimes that can be a good thing. Uh, they also make it more complex. So you could look at it as the more dissonance you have, the more unapproachable something is. Um, it gives things a emotional context of um, either anxiety or dread. Like, just going through these minor seconds, you get this really impending sense of doom because you have this slow motion and you have all of this complex ratio uh, or all of these complex ratios between the intervals just kind of like grinding against each other. Um, you could look at it also as the harmonics rubbing against each other. The closer overtones of two notes are to each other, the more tension there is. This also gets into things like phase cancellation. Um, if you ever want to hate yourself or go on some sort of weird uh, existential journey, get into whatever headspace you need to to be able to do this activity. Um, Go to a piano, play a C note. Then play that note against a C sharp. You hear, do you hear like there's like soft volume change? Now, do it with D. That vibration changes. Vibration changes again. Slower. A little bit faster. Notice the vibration gets faster the more dissonant the note is. So that phase cancellation between the overtones creates this vibration, and it's like a secondary uh, ratio that your brain has to try and understand. Um, so, uh, you really want to watch out for that. The last thing I should say about dissonance versus tension. Now, if I play this chord, there we go. This is an insanely dissonant chord. We have a tritone, we have a flat nine. It's just like screaming for something. We could even add a tritone in against our root. But feel that going to here. Oh. It's just so sweet, so warm, so like comforting once we've come back to that pure, not pure, but that simple, even harmonic ratio of that major chord. Just nice, simple ratios like we saw in that Adam Neely video. But we used a tritone. We used the tritone against our root, and we used the flat nine. So why does that not sound bad? Well, partially is because it sounds intentional. 
this it has a sense of directionality to it it wants to end there but if i'm playing around or and i kind of like hit a weird note it's like hard to like both play correctly and incorrectly on this tiny ass keyboard but like so that right there it sounded out of place when i was right there that moment part of what makes it not work is that it sounds like i made a mistake because what our ears are expecting when we hear is you're expecting to hear a couple things something like maybe this or that, that, or like there's so many ways it can work, but because we've hit this dissonance and we haven't uh, fulfilled some sort of expectation, and also these don't quite resolve the way we're expecting them to. It feels like a mistake. It feels like we did something we didn't intend to. So the more dissonant an interval is, whether played uh, harmonically at the same time or melodically, it sounds like a mistake. It sounds like we did something we didn't intend to, but if we have it as part of a greater idea, it just feels nice. It feels good. So hopefully that helps a little bit, sister cousin. I think that a lot of people mistake dissonance for tension because dissonance is a very a uh, common part of tension in music. But as you start separating them out in your head, as you start treating them as two different things, um, you can start to look at like what makes one work, what makes the other work, what are their similarities and what are their differences? And you can apply them into your productions as you see fit. Are there common rules to know which dissonance has to resolve to which consonance besides knowing harmony? Um, I would say generally the rules for having dissonance to resolve a certain way is going to be, uh, see your question anyone, um, are going to be about uh, the voice leading. So if I play this chord right here, I have essentially five different voices, five different singers played by my fingers on this piano. Oops, sorry. There we go. In terms of the uh, notes. And it's asking where do these notes want to go? So in terms of this five to one motion, I might actually make this more dissonant. Yeah, let's give it that flat nine. So this voice wants to go up or down to the root, right? Like that. So this voice has a way it wants to go. This voice wants to go down. This voice wants to come up. This voice wants to climb down. And then this voice wants to climb down. So look at where all of those notes are moving to in the next chord. This up, this down, this up, this down, this down. Apart from the bass, every single voice moves no more than a major second no more than the distance of two semitones. Pretty smooth, if you ask me. 
It doesn't have to be only a major or minor second, but as kind of a, a framework to stay consonant, um, I'll put it that way, um, or to handle dissonance. Two things. One, think about where each note is going to in the next chord. And two, don't think about where the last chord was. Chords don't care where they came from. They only care where they're going. As soon as you have landed on a chord, the previous chord ceases to exist. It's no longer a thing that happens. It's invisible. But that chord cares very strongly about where it's going to. Where is this voice going? Where is this voice going? Where is this voice going? How do I make that feel comfortable? This is one of the reasons why I recommend people to sing even if you're not a singer. If you are a musician and you don't sing, you are removing an instrument that you have with you everywhere. As long as you can hold a pitch that is sonically close to the note that's being played on an actual instrument, like a piano or a guitar or a synthesizer, then you have everything for you. You hum. Humming is okay. I will say a lot of people hum, but humming is subpar. Humming is not the optimal way of doing it. Humming can work, but you don't have air flowing. You have air circulating. <laughs> but the air is essentially trapped right here inside of your mouth. Having the air move out into the actual physical space around you, bounce off the walls, that will be better. Because when we're talking about voice leading, we talk about the history of voice leading. What we are looking at is music, again, that came from churches, which came from monasteries, which were big fucking stone buildings which had really reflective walls with really long decay times on the reverb, basically. Um, so if you, were if you were singing a note and someone else was singing a different note and then they hung around and then someone changed notes and it didn't work with the previous notes being sung, it would reverberate and it would sound dissonant. We would have that tension left over and... Back then, they weren't trained enough to know that, hey, that can be really good in the context of something like uh, this. Wait, what do I want to do? Um, something like that chord going to there. Um, so they just avoid it altogether. Um, so... If you want to make sure your voice leading feels consonant, feels comfortable, you want to be able to hear, even subconsciously, the reverberations of note A moving to note B. So yeah, you can go, <laughs> but all that sound is getting trapped in this cavity right here. Ba -da 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 -da. It feels a lot more um, comfortable. But again, you don't have to necessarily do that. I'm not going to say you can't hum, but I recommend you sing. And yes, that is in fact my subscriber notification. That is true. Um, let's see. Uh, Omi had a question, I think, on this topic. Are there songs where you leave it at dissonance that works? Uh, going the opposite way from constant to dissonance? Or if you're trying to create a creepy atmosphere? Um, what would you recommend as practice to learn stuff, nor resources online? Uh, I'd have to think about resources on it. I'd really have to think on that. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, but I can say in terms of uh, going from consonants to dissonance, yes. Um, then uh, you are definitely trying to lean into that thing I mentioned before about intentionality. Having something that's smooth morph into something that's dissonant is good. Having something that's dissonant morph into something that's good 
or something that's consonant is good. Having something that moves rapidly back and forth is a problem. Uh, context is king. Uh, this will be the last thing I say on the subject, and then we'll move on to the uh, the next one. But if I am playing this chord progression, oops, uh, and then I play this, and I stop on this chord right here. Um, this is a very tense chord because in the context of everything else, this is a very smooth triad, very smooth triad, very smooth triad. Dissonant, dominant, seventh chord. Ooh. Because it wants to go to here. It wants to feel resolved. But if I have... to here. Oops. Uh, there we go. None of those chords felt as dissonant as they did on their own because they're all dominant sevenths. They all have the same level of dissonance. There's nothing that is trying to contrast itself. You want to think about the relationships of your chords in that way in order to make sure you don't lean too far into dissonance feeling like a mistake rather than uh, dissonance feeling like an intention.